I've hopped on the cryptocurrency bandwagon and I'm going for a ride and in today's video I'm going to be sharing with you why I've decided to invest in cryptocurrency. So you may or may not recall a few months ago I published a video sharing my thoughts on cryptocurrency and I had shared that I think it's an opportunity but I'm not really banking on it and I shared with you that I invested in crypto a number of years ago just a few thousand dollars left it, set it, forget it, um, but it hasn't been my focus. Uh, and, and so I invested primarily in the stock market and that performed really well for me, but I completely neglected cryptocurrency. And frankly, the reason being is because I did not understand it. I didn't take the time to educate myself on the subject. So fast forward to today, my, I've had a change of heart, if you will. Uh, and that's simply because I've just learned more about it. I've just educated myself more to the point where I understand it to a degree that is enough for me to see the value in it. And now I am actively investing in cryptocurrency. I'm holding cryptocurrency. So I want to try and explain to you in this video what is cryptocurrency and why it's revolutionizing our financial system. This is the best way I understand it. I'm not someone, you know, there's people who told me, Tatiana, you should invest in crypto. It's the future. Um, for me, that's not good enough. I need more of an explanation, more of an understanding on why. Um, so that's what I'm going to try and offer you today. It might be, not be super eloquent. I'm going to do my best to explain things in terms that I understand. So in order to understand cryptocurrency, we have to first take it back to, um, to, to the beginning of money. I mean, what was money? Money has always simply been value. That's all it is. It's what we perceive as valuable. So throughout history, money came in different forms, salt, wheat, shells, and eventually gold. And so these were all mediums for exchange. Um, and in order for something to represent value, we have to trust that it is indeed valuable and that it will hold value in the future so that when we want to redeem it in the future, we can, you know, we're going to, we're going to be able to, to get money from it or be able to exchange it in the future because it's going to hold that value. So we always trusted in something, in a commodity. And in that case at the time, gold, we trusted in the value of gold and that it would remain valuable for a period of time. So this is going to be important because you're going to hear about how we've made a shift in our trust model from trusting in something to trusting in someone and why that's important. So when gold was our way of exchanging and exchanging value, it was a bit cumbersome to walk around carrying gold, gold coins, gold blocks, uh, not exactly ideal or practical. So at a certain point in time, governments or banks would offer to take possession of our gold and in exchange, they would give us a receipt. And that receipt or that bill would indicate the value of gold that we hold at the bank. And so then we could go and we could exchange, we could trade these paper bills. And that was just much more practical. And at any point in time, we could go back to the bank and we could um, collect our gold by exchanging our paper for our gold. And so that was the model, that was the system. And it was uh, paper receipts were created just out of practicality and convenience. But then at a certain point in time, we moved away from the gold standard. Why that is, is more complex than I understand or that I can explain in this video. And so at a certain point in time, governments told their people that they would be liable for the value of the paper money. And so basically we said, let's, let's just forget about gold and let's just continue trading paper money. And so people continued to trade paper money, uh, not backed by any commodity like gold, but simply backed by the promise of the government. And so the reason why this worked is because there is a level of trust, trust in the government. And so this is where the trust model changed from trusting in the value of a commodity to trusting in the promise of uh, a government uh, or a bank. And so this is when fiat money was created. Uh, fiat money is not backed by any commodity of value. It's valuable simply because the government orders it. So you can rest assured that if you receive a bill, a $10 bill, that you can go and you can use that bill to purchase $10 worth of groceries, say, at the store because the government orders it. 
Um, so this worked because of trust. Again, trusting in someone instead of trusting in something. So Fiat has two main drawbacks. Number one is that it is centralized. So a central authority controls and issues uh, fiat money. And number two, it's not limited in quantity. So they can print as much money as they want. And that's an issue because when you're printing money, more money is getting distributed out into the economy. And then that actually devalues the currency. Uh, it's kind of like when there is artwork, for example, a famous artist, they're only going to sell a specific number of paintings or pictures. Um, because if they were to sell unlimited prints, then that would devalue the piece of art. But when they say this is only limited to three pieces, they can charge more because there's more value in that. Fewer people will be able to get their hands on it. And so that's the trouble and it causes inflation. And so when you go to the store and you see that um, a box of milk costs more than it did uh, two, three years ago, it's not necessarily because the cost of the product is more, it's more because um, the value of your dollar is less. Your purchasing power is worth less. You have less purchasing power. So that's the issue with just printing money. And we're seeing a lot of that today with what's happened with uh, the pandemic and um, the debt that we're in. So fiat money was established with a central authority. And once that central authority was established, it was easy to transition to digital money. Digital money, what's digital money? It's what you and I use primarily today. It's uh, our credit cards, it's PayPal transactions, it's wire transfers, it's anything that's not physical money. And physical money is kind of like disappearing these days. Um, if I open my wallet, I've probably got 20 to 40 bucks worth in physical money, but I've got maybe five or six credit cards in there. So the majority of the money that I have is digital money. Um, so day by day, uh, we're, we're kind of, um, physical money is disappearing. So digital money um, is, uh, the challenge with it is that if you have a file that says that you have a dollar, what's preventing you from duplicating that file and now you have two dollars or a thousand dollars or a million dollars. So this is called the double spend problem. And so the current financial system solution to that was a centralized solution by keeping a ledger in the bank. So whatever bank you're banking at, they have a ledger in their main computer and that ledger records all of the transactions and balances of all of their clients. Um, and so that's what will prevent you from, say, you know, duplicating your balance. Like they know what is, is there. So that's on the ledger inside the bank. So the problem with centralized money is that you give someone complete control over the money supply. And in doing so, you give them power. Where the money is, is the power. And so even though it's your money, you earned it, you are storing it at the bank and uh, you may seemingly have control over it, but at any point in time, it's possible that your money, your accounts get frozen and you no longer have access to your funds. And this has happened. This has happened in India where even cash accounts were frozen and it happened recently in Lebanon. Uh, another challenge is that it, when there's one central authority, it can lead to corruption uh, and mismanagement as well. And so we saw this, for example, with the Wells Fargo scandal, um, which was they were um, creating fake uh, accounts and credit cards in order to uh, inflate the numbers of the bank and misleading their clients for many years. And it eventually was uh, exposed and it was a huge scandal. So um, not really ideal, okay? So this was the state of our financial system up until 2009. And in 2009, Bitcoin was first introduced by an anonymous person or persons named Satoshi. And he suggested a decentralized solution called Bitcoin. And so Bitcoin solved the double spend problem. So um, the double spend problem without a central bank. So the best way to compare it is this, this, the central bank right now uh, solves the double spend problem by having a ledger inside the bank. And that ledger keeps a tally of all the transactions and balances. But who has access to that ledger? 
you and I don't have access to it. It's inside the bank, it's inside one main computer, um, so it's not transparent at all. And so this Bitcoin solution uh, was that um, Bitcoin is transparent. The ledger is visible to everyone. So in a similar way, there is a ledger with Bitcoin, with cryptocurrency, and we can trade, we can, we can send money wherever we want, we can do whatever we want with our crypto, but it's all publicly visible. Everyone can see, if, if there was a transaction, if I sent $10,000 to Brazil, anyone would be able to see that $10,000 was sent to Brazil. What you won't be able to see is who sent that money to whom. And so it's called Suedo Anonymous. You can see the transactions, you just can't see the names uh, attached to those transactions. So it's very transparent and it's decentralized. So there's not one bank with one main computer that holds the ledger, but there are thousands of computers connected by the blockchain and each one of those computers holds the same ledger. Why is this important? Well, it's very hard for someone to hack into that ledger. If someone wanted to hack into that ledger, not only would they have to hack into one, and uh, fudge around with it, but thousands simultaneously. Um, so everyone has a copy, not everyone, but everyone who's participating in the blockchain has a copy of this ledger and it's transparent for everyone. So um, Bitcoin is really big news because it is an alternative to the current system. It's, it's a form of money that no government or bank can control. And we like this. Uh, I think a lot of people like this, maybe not everyone, but I think a lot of people like this. Um, and the best way to describe it is the reason why decentralization is of value to us is if you look back at the centralized flow of information back in before the internet was around. Right. If you wanted to uh, collect some information, there were a few major players who would share information. The New York Times, um, the Washington Post, um, that's how you would get your information. So it was very centralized. Um, then comes about the internet and with a click of a button, you can learn anything from anyone all over the world. You can simultaneously consume and share information. And so it's a decentralized way to consume information. And that has led to probably more, a lot more positives than negatives. I mean, you can, it only makes sense when only a few people have information and that's how you're getting your information. It's filtered through a handful of major players. Uh, there's a lot more potential for, uh, corruption and you name it, than if everyone has access equally to information with the click of a button. So that's an example of centralized information becoming decentralized. And the same thing is happening with our financial system, going from centralized where the banks and uh, government have control over our uh, money to decentralize where we have full control. Only you have control over your money. I like that. <laughs> so another benefit of cryptocurrency is that it cuts the middlemen out of the process. So there's going to be fewer fees. You know, if you want to send a wire transfer, it is, it's so tiring to go to the bank. I've, I've, cause I've, I've sent so many wire transfers in my business over the years. It's a lengthy process. You got to go to the bank. You got to set up all this information. It takes time for the wire to send. And there's all these fees, you know, sometimes $50 to send and the receiver also has to pay some fees. Um, with cryptocurrency, there's no middleman. There's no one sitting there. There's no one at an, uh, a desk. There's no one at a bank. It's just you sending money. It's instantaneous, practically not instantaneous. It can take some time, depends on what you're sending, but it's quick, it's efficient, and it's a lot more affordable. And also, this is something that I didn't know. Um, cryptocurrency opens up digital commerce to 2.5 million people all around the world who don't have access to the current financial system. So I didn't realize this, but there are millions of people who have access to the internet, have smartphones, but they don't have access to a bank. There's no banks in their area. And I found this to be true. Um, just recently, I was just thinking about it. I've been communicating with some kids um, from Ethiopia uh, that uh, I, when I went there, I got their information. I was like, How, wait a minute, like we have internet, we're communicating with each other, but yet they have trouble to, to build an online business because they don't have a way of, of receiving money and storing money. They don't have a bank account. 
Um, so this now opens up the possibility for millions of people to now access this new financial system and create new ways of earning income. Um, so I think it's really cool. So where I'm at right now, I'm adding this in. It's, it's, I'm allocating a portion of my portfolio to cryptocurrency. A lot of people, you'll hear the figure 5% of your portfolio dedicated to cryptocurrency. You do you, I'm not a financial advisor. Um, I am continuing to invest in stocks, in real estate, in startups, but cryptocurrency is just another way for me to diversify my investments. And I'm holding crypto because I believe in the long term. I believe that it's going to grow enormously. I mean, just think about it. Look at Bitcoin. So Bitcoin, um, you know, I, I don't know, I think it was two, maybe 2009 when it was first um, released. But if you look back in 2014, you could buy one Bitcoin for around $400. And fast forward to uh, today, 2021, one Bitcoin's roughly $61,000. So in seven year time, I mean, this is why people are becoming millionaires overnight. <laughs> people are becoming very wealthy. If you were an early adopter of Bitcoin, um, yes, it's extremely volatile. Uh, but if you held on for that period of time, now it's worth so much. So I definitely am holding crypto, not just Bitcoin, but other coins as well. Um, and in addition to that, I'm doing something called grid trading. And this is what I'm really excited about because uh, in addition to holding crypto, I can also make passive income. So not only will I benefit from the appreciation of the crypto, but I also am making passive income during, how do I explain it, with grid trading, whenever it buys or sells, I make money on the volatility of crypto. So one of the criticisms of crypto is that it's extremely volatile. But with the grid trading that I'm doing, I actually make money from that volatility. So for me, it's kind of like a win-win. Um, yes, there are disadvantages to crypto. There are risks, just like with any other kind of investment. Um, you can, uh, I'll probably create some more videos on this subject, but um, at this point in time, I have had a change of belief when it comes to the opportunity of this. Um, and I'm really excited for where it is, what's to come. Um, I think it's gonna be big. So I want to share it with you guys. Just want to share with you guys that, you know, I've had a change of mindset. Uh, don't listen to what I said in that previous video. Although I, I didn't say anything bad about crypto. I just said that I wasn't really expecting much of it. But now I am. Now I feel like this definitely has a lot of potential. So um, how long it's going to take for the masses to adopt crypt crypto? Uh, I don't know. That could be a long time. But nonetheless, I think this is, this is the beginning and I want to be on, on the precipice. I want to be the early, an early adopter. Uh, and so, um, yeah. So if you enjoyed this video, let me know. Uh, shout out to the channel 99 Bitcoins. Lots of great information. If you want to learn more about uh, Bitcoin and trading, check out their channel. I definitely learned a lot from them. Uh, and if you want more videos on cryptocurrency, let me know in the comment section below. Um, and uh, if you go to tatianajames.com slash crypto, you can sign up for my mailing list and I'm going to be sharing with you guys more about the grid trading that I've been doing. This is a way that I've been making, it's a new stream of passive, passive income. Uh, it's doing really well for me uh, uh, and I am currently sharing it with my family and friends, but soon I will be sharing it with you guys on, on YouTube and particularly to those of you on my mailing list. So sign up for my mailing list. This will, you'll get only uh, information about uh, grid trading and cryptocurrency. So go to tatianajames.com slash crypto. Thanks for watching guys. I hope you enjoyed this video and I'll see you guys next time. Bye.